Hello, my name is Miss Kilburn Bond and I work with all of the English teachers in the schools across the Athelstan Trust. In this video I'm going to be talking to you about the poem Poppies by Jane Weir. So if you haven't already got a copy of the poem in front of you, it would be helpful for you to pause, get yourself a copy of the poem, pencils, highlighters, a pen, something that you can use to make some notes and annotations as we go through. And the learning objectives of the video, I'm hoping that by the end we will have read and you will have developed a better understanding of the poem Poppies by Jane Weir. That will help with assessment objective one in exam terms. Also to explore how language, form and structure create meaning in the poem because you have to show that you don't just understand what the poem is about, you need to be able to explain how the poet has got those ideas across. And then finally we're going to look at how the context might further influence meaning. So for AO3 what that means is what do you know about when the poem was written? What perhaps do we need to know about the poet that might help us understand why the poem has been written in this way and why it covers the themes that it does? <laughs> And we already know the poem is called Poppies, and that symbol of a poppy, it's difficult to hear the name of that flower without thinking also about war and conflict, because the poppy, since the First World War, has been used as a symbol of remembrance for those who have sacrificed their lives in any conflict. And if we think about the poem in the context of remembrance, in the context of being a symbol of loss and sacrifice, then that's going to help us immediately understand some of the main emotions in this poem. Now it's a poem that is a war poem but it wasn't written in one of the great wars, the world wars of World War One and World War Two, which other poems in the collection focus on. This is a poem that was written more recently. So it was first written in 2005 and then um, published to great acclaim again in 2009. And this was a time where in that last sort of 10 years, in a decade at the start of this century, the news the images in the media would have, a lot of them would have concentrated on the wars in Afghanistan and the wars in Iraq, wars that all linked into the global war on terrorism. So if you look at the images on the screen now, those are some of the sorts of things that the poet Jane Weir would have been seeing every time she turned on the news or checked any social media. And the numbers of coalition forces killed in those wars are um, truly horrifying. So if we look at the war in Afghanistan, then more than 3,500 troops from the NATO-led coalition were killed during that time. In the Iraqi war, then we've got numbers of about 4,700 troops. So to see soldiers, British soldiers brought home to Britain, Jane was a British poet, that would have been something that was often on the news and would have given her um, food for thought. And the numbers, if we then look at the numbers of Afghan civilians and Iraqi civilians and their own troops, then you know, we get in above the hundreds of thousands. So a really um, difficult time in, in the world in terms of looking at peace and conflict. So really important to be aware that this is when Jane Weir was writing. And on that note, we actually need to reference another poet. So the poet Carol Ann Duffy, who you'll be familiar from the poem War Photographer in your anthology. Carol Ann Duffy um, was the previous poet laureate. And in 2009, she got together a group of poets and asked them to give her poems that could become modern war poems. So this is a quote um, from her talking in a newspaper about this collection of poems that she called Exit Wounds. Today, as most of us do, poets largely experience war 
wherever it rages, through emails or texts from friends or colleagues in war zones, through radio or newsprint or television, through blogs or tweets or interviews. With the official inquiry into Iraq imminent and the war in Afghanistan returning dead teenagers to the streets of Wootton Bassett, I invited a range of my fellow poets to bear witness, each in their own way, to these matters of war. So she called on poets that were alive at this time to write modern war poems. So just like in the First World War, particularly, we've got a lot of famous war poets like Wilfred Owen, who we'll talk about again in a moment. Carol Ann Duffy was trying to create a collection of poets that could last as a testament to those wars in Afghanistan and Iraq in particular. And one of those poets who was involved in this project was the poet Jane Weir. And she gave Carol Ann Duffy a poem that she'd written a couple of years before, a poem called Poppies that we've now got in our anthologies. And BBC Derbyshire covered this story and here's what they said about her. A mother of two teenage boys herself, Jane tried to put herself in the grieving parent's place. Believing that loss and grief cross any timeline, Jane also drew on the experiences of the poets of the First World War. She learned that Wilfred Owen's mother, Susan, poignantly heard the news of his death as the bells rang out on Armistice Day. It was that poignancy she tried to preserve in her poem. So we've got several things going on here that's worth being aware of when we're thinking about AO3, when we're thinking about how you can show your understanding of context and how that helps us understand the poem. So we already know we've got a poem that's inspired by conflict at the start of the 21st century. We can think about it being in response to the great losses in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And now we can also link it to this project by Carol Ann Duffy, so trying to create a collection of modern war poems to reflect those experiences. But what we also find out here is that Jane Weir herself is a mother of two boys, and so for her as a mother of two boys, and you know, it wouldn't necessarily just be boys, but she was reflecting when seeing any remembrance service or being next to a war memorial about what it must be like to be the grieving parent of a soldier who's killed in conflict. And I've watched an interview with her where she talks about how she used to take one of her children, I think it's her youngest son, would often actually go and play in a graveyard up near a war memorial. And in doing so, she often would think about the mothers particularly of those soldiers who died. And then she learned the story that Wilfred Owen, so a poet who we also look at in your anthology for this exam, that Wilfred Owen tragically died just before the end of the First World War. And apparently his mother heard the news as the bells were ringing out for Armistice Day. So she was struck by the poignancy of this and decided in this poem to try and get that idea across. And that explains why we have three days before Armistice Sunday, why we have this mother who's grieving for her son so close to being a day of remembrance and supposedly linked to the idea of peace too. So quite a complicated idea, but that's something that can really help you show a sophisticated understanding of the poem's context. Because it was a sort of daily thing we used to do, come up here, um, seeing the gravestones, especially of the war dead, that made me think about, you know, the idea of losing a child and what that must feel like. A lot of the graves were of young men, soldiers and airmen. Some were only as young as 18 years old, you know. And as a mother, I kind of tried to almost put myself, if you can at all, into the position of people that may have lost either husbands, lovers, children. And this is the one more which I describe in the poem as leaning against like a wishbone, which is really what I thought the mother, the character in the poem, did. And over there, and you can only just about hear it now, is the ghostly sound of children's voices in the playground. So Papa's is really a poem of remembrance. It's remembering the dead, it's remembering not just them dead, but as alive and as active as the boy is in, in the poem. And it's falling really fine, the myth now, 
and the leaves are all burnished and golden. And sometimes when the breeze falls, they just shower the ground. Not like poppies, but like lost souls, really. And it just, I think this time of year reminds you of the people who were here, not just long ago, but people who are fighting now in wars and who are also dying. And I think it's important for each generation, really, to remember that. And with that context behind us, that will help us now be able to look at the poem in more detail. So we've already talked about the title. Remember, when you're looking at a poem, a title is really important. It can help establish what the poem's about. What we haven't yet done, though, is actually read the poem. So let's, before we carry on, let's just pause, read the poem. I'm going to read it to you once, and then I'd ask you to stop the video, pause the video, and read the poem a couple of times yourself, because every time you read it, a little bit more will settle in your mind and you'll feel more and more confident about what it's about. Poppies by Jane Weir. Three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of paper red disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled blackthorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt slowly melting. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy, making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. So what we've got here is a poem that we can describe as a monologue, a monologue being one speaker telling us their story in an extended way. So one speaker, a single speaker, speaking alone. And of course, the speaker that we have in this poem is the mother in the story. So it's told in first person and what that does is it gives us as the reader a really strong empathy with the mother's perspective. So we learn about this story with a sense that we're inside her thoughts and feelings. We really see what it's like to be her. The poem has got no regular rhythm, no regular rhyme scheme. So it's irregular. It's a free verse poem. And yeah, we can talk about how that reflects natural thoughts and memories. She speaks in a way that we can relate to. It's not being structured in a really strict way with rhyme. And that helps create this sort of sad mood. And the structure of the poem, it's chronological. It happens in order. However, the time frame is quite ambiguous. That means it's quite difficult to know how much time there is between events in the poem. And the memories are not always clearly distinguished in terms of what happened a long time ago and what's just happening. And that skewed perception of time is actually quite clever. The mixing of past and present tense, the fact that she seems to be talking as if she's already lost her son before he's even left. All of this is a really clever way of portraying someone who is grieving, someone who is confused by grief, who is constantly trying to relive and pull back memories because they're experiencing such a great sense of loss. So lots of things already that we can say about the way in which the poem has been written and that's our AO2. 
So let's look at stanza one. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already. The first line gives us a really strong sense of setting and context. Three days before Armistice Sunday. So Armistice Sunday being remembering the day that the First World War came to an end, that peace was called. So the immediate context is linked to conflict straight away and it quickly establishes this reminder to us as the reader that war and conflict is often about death, is often about having to remember people who've lost their lives in conflict. So we're immediately thrown into that world. Three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. And that immediate giving us a symbol of all the graves, the image of all those war graves, again, is reminding us that war and death are closely linked together. And the fact that poppies have already been placed on the graves is reminding us that people still love and care and remember and respect those who've given their lives in conflict before you left. So we've now got the introduction of a second person in the poem. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Now touch, the sense of touch is going to be really important in this poem. This is where we first meet it. So we've got this mother who is touching her son in that she's pinning, physically pinning, onto his lapel of his blazer the petal. Now I'm going to use his because she's talked herself, Jane Weir, about how the poem was inspired by partly by Wilfred Owen and partly by thinking about her own sons. Obviously you could read the poem and decide it could also be a female soldier who's leaving, it could be her daughter. So before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel crimped petals. So again, we're going back to this image of the poppy. Now poppies themselves, their symbolism really strong, partly the symbolism of the red poppy, red often linked to that image of blood, as well as a poppy immediately being linked to remembering those who've died. We've got some great alliteration here as well. We can call it um, plosive alliteration. So we've got the pinned and the petals and the paper red, that per sound. And that pulls out those words to the forefront of the poem because of it being such a sound that forces you to almost take a breath. It actually changes the sound of the poem and it makes those words pull out. And if we look at those words, they're making us really focus on those themes of the poppy. So remembrance and death through conflict are being immediately sort of thrown towards us as being particularly important. So even though what she's doing is quite a peaceful task, putting a poppy onto his lapel, there's also language in here that is deliberately reminding us about war and violence. There's a lot of military imagery in this same image. So we've got the spasms of the paper red poppy. So the spasms reminding us of pain and then disrupting a blockade. A blockade would normally be a military term used in conflict. And then we've got the yellow bias binding around your blazer. Now that bit isn't military, what we've got now is actually the language of textiles, the language of embroidery and sewing, a domestic image that's against the military. So we've got the mother representing the domestic world and her son going into conflict representing the military world and all the symbolism of the death of the soldier. And we could use the word foreboding or foreshadowing here because a lot of this seems to be suggesting the death of the soldier, that actually there's a feeling that something bad is going to happen to this soldier. You might have noticed there's some long sentences as well already in the poem, and there's also enjambement, so lines that flow over onto the next line, so the sentence continues over several lines. And all of that gives the impression that the narrator's really absorbed in her own thoughts and feelings. She's lost in her thoughts. Also, the idea that she's kind of anxious, that everything isn't really happening in a particularly careful or structured way, and that continues throughout the poem. So on to stanza two, and we immediately start with more domestic imagery, put deliberately next to military imagery. So we start with the sellotape bandaged around my hand. I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could. So sellotape, a domestic everyday object, and the sellotape is being 
bandaged around her hand. The word bandaged immediately throwing us back into the idea of perhaps a wounded soldier of an injury. And she's really deliberately putting these two things together all the time. So sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white capped hairs as I could. So by putting the sellotape around her hand, what she's literally doing is putting the sellotape against the cat hairs on his uniform and it pulls the hairs off. But she deliberately uses words like, I rounded up, another military expression, because she's constantly reminding us that the reality of conflict is never far from her mind. Even though what she's doing seems quite loving and domestic, she can't stop thinking about the danger that her son is in as she's doing this. Smooth down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. Now the softening of my face presumably is suggesting that she's struggling not to cry and the fact that she's stealing against this shows that she's trying really hard to be strong not to show her emotions and her fears. So she's being a protective maternal character here, she wants to keep her son safe, she's frightened for his safety and that conflict we as a reader can be inside her head because of this first person monologue and we know that that's what's happening. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. So this emotiveness here, this really powerful emotion that she's trying to control, again we're inside her mind and her thoughts and what she's trying to stop herself doing is go back into the past, there's this feeling of nostalgia, she wants to go back to a time where she could keep her son safe, where she could play with her son, where everything was innocent and loving and felt like she could keep him protected. So to play this game we've got the touch idea again, I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos. Everything is about physical contact and touch in this poem, she wants to hold on to her little boy who's no longer little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. So hopefully you've noticed more touch, more sensory imagery here. She stops herself, she's really trying hard this mum to control her instinct. What she wants to do is to run her fingers through his hair. And look at the way his hair is described through the gelled blackthorns of your hair. Now presumably the soldier who's obviously taking great pride in his appearance has gelled his hair and gel can make hair quite um, sort of prickly and hard if you've ever tried to run your hands through someone's hair with gel in. It's actually quite tough to do so. So she uses a metaphor here and she describes that gelled hair as being like gelled blackthorns. Now what that image does is it actually takes us to some religious imagery because Jesus when crucified, so when on the cross, is reportedly wearing a wreath of thorns. So around his head he's wearing kind of a wreath of what could be black thorns around his own hair. And of course Jesus is seen, if you're in the Christian faith, Jesus is seen as making the ultimate sacrifice. So Jesus who dies to save others, if you like, to represent others. So a soldier can then be compared to Jesus on the cross as making the ultimate sacrifice. So sacrifice meaning a loss, something you give up usually for the sake of a better cause and that can definitely be applied to the life of being a soldier. So really clever powerful imagery again there also linked to this idea of touch. Lots of connotations happening, lots of relying on us to be able to read one thing and think about something else. And there's also some really interesting caesura in this poem. So remember caesura meaning when across a line there's an interruption in the middle of the line, often through a full stop. So where we're sort of forced to pause where normally you might expect there to be fluency. And this caesura is all about disrupting her her feelings and her thoughts. Everything about the poem suggests that she's trying really hard to hold on and stop her emotions and not let things run away, but it's really hard for her to do that. When we get to the very end of this stanza, we see that the enjambement on the same in the same spirit 
continues over into the next stanza. She doesn't even get to the end of her sentence before sort of having to break and start a different idea. So it's all spilling over with this sense that she's really struggling to keep hold of her emotions. And in fact, that last image, all my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. Well, that in itself means that she can't say the right thing, is all coming out wrong, like fabric that's coming apart. Now what we need to know about Jane Weir is she's also a textiles designer, so she works with material and that's one of her passions. So she uses that in this poem and she uses the imagery which we could link to domestic imagery, which you know, traditionally, stereotypically, we might link to a woman to the role of a mother, of using textiles to describe how she feels. So really clever how just as she's saying that like a piece of felt, her words are all kind of coming apart, that's where she uses the enjambement into the next stanza, with slowly melting, not coming, until we start the next stanza. I'm a designer and I, when I was writing this poem, I was trying to think of ways of actually using metaphors um, from my own textile practices and... Grief is a really difficult emotion to capture in a way that doesn't sound cheesy or completely sentimental or even false. And I tend to think about emotion through thread and through cloth and weave and pattern even. And then I was looking at a piece of felt that a friend of mine had brought in and I started to think about the process of felt making and I thought it was a good way of explaining the way grief compacts upon itself. If you think about felt making, you think about the layers, the way they overlap with each other and then almost melt into a kind of solidity and form a kind of barrier, a sort of muffling barrier to, to pain or to anything that tries to penetrate it. I thought that would be a really interesting way of actually talking about pain and in a way about loss and what we actually do with loss and where it goes in the body. And the line, all my wor words rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting, was really a way of trying to convey what happens to emotion when it enters the body. And Emily Dickinson, the great American poet, talked about grief. She talked about after great pain, a feeling, a formal feeling comes. It seems so true. So we're in her mind. We know from that last stanza how it's clear she's really battling with all these mixed emotions and trying to be strong for her son. And that leads really nicely into this next phrase, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. Now she's playing with conventions here because com in conventional ideas and symbolism, it's the soldier who's brave. We're used to the image of the soldier being the person who's putting his or her life at risk. But what she does as a mother in this poem is she says that actually it's her that's being brave in letting her son leave and walk towards the danger. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. So the simile shows us that she's being really brave, she's bravely throwing open the door out of support and encouragement for her son and what lies outside the door is this world that is overflowing and from the soldier's point of view, from the son's point of view, someone who's growing up to be independent and setting out on an adventure, what's outside that door is like a treasure chest, is something that's got all the promise of being something glittering and beautiful and exciting and adventurous. And then we've got the caesura, so we have the full stop, like a treasure chest, a split second, and you were away. It all happens so fast, and the timing, how you're forced to read the poem reflects that. And you were away, intoxicated. So intoxicated, a word that you might associate with being drunk, the idea of being kind of so eager, he's almost drunk with excitement to set 
off on this new adventure of being a soldier and that's in total contrast with the mother's fears and anxieties in the poem. The son's enthusiasm about having this freedom and this exciting future is constantly set against the mother's anxiety and her desperation to go back to the past and be able to keep her son safe. Her son just sees adventure and not danger. And that end stop, so the fact that we don't have on Jean Beaumont here, we actually have intoxicated with the full stop at the end of the lines called an end stop, that's quite unusual in this poem and it makes us, it forces us to focus on this moment. And the idea of this moment is that there's no going back. This is actually going to be the last time that she sees her son. This was their last goodbye. So again, it's very clever to make that line end there a split second and you were away, intoxicated. And the rest of the poem suggests that she never sees her son again. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Now this is a metaphor. She's not really releasing a bird from a cage. What she's talking about is the idea that like a songbird, something beautiful that brings joy in their song, she knows it's wrong to keep him in a cage, it's wrong to keep him from his future and from his freedom and even though she fears for his safety she knows that she has to let him go. Later a single dove flew from the pear tree and this is where it has led me. The time as I've already said, is a little bit confusing in the poem. The poem is chronological, things happen in the right order, but whether later means the next day, the next year, we just don't know. It's an undisclosed amount of time. But she deliberately keeps us in the same stanza because we go from the metaphorical songbird to then her watching this dove flying away from the pear tree. And a dove being a symbol of peace often. So a single dove flew from the pear tree and this is where it has led me. There's a sense of lack of purpose and control in terms of the mother knowing where she's going. It's the dove who sort of takes her on a journey, leads her to the churchyard and it all links to the last memory of her son leaving and the idea that she's not going to actually see him again. So this sense of her not really knowing where her future's taking her now starts to take over. This is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. So we're back into the textiles imagery again. So she's using, Jane Weir's using her own passion as a textiles artist to create these metaphors. So when she says her stomach is busy making tucks, darts, pleats, She's using the language of being a textiles artist, but actually what she's describing is her stomach being anxious. We might use the phrase butterflies in your stomach. So she's clearly anxious as she follows this dove through to the churchyard. And she describes herself as being hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf gloves. Now we're right back to the military imagery again, particularly of a First World War soldier wearing a winter coat and the freezing conditions of those winters in the First World War. And what we also though have is the idea that this mother is not prepared, is not protected. She's not suitably equipped to deal with the situation she's in. And we can link this to the idea of grief. In her grief-stricken state, she's lost purpose, she's lost control. It's the dove who's taking her somewhere, she's no longer in control of what's happening and she's not prepared to be kept safe from where she is or what she's seeing. So some really sad, emotive representations of a grief-stricken mother as well in this stanza. OK, now we've reached the last stanza, which you might have noticed is a little bit shorter. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. Now Jane Weir herself has lived near um, a war memorial that is on a hill, so she's using partly her own experience here. When she gets to this war memorial, the mother traces the inscriptions on the war memorial. So the idea that it sounds like she's touching, so again that sensory imagery using touch a lot of the time here to chase the names of the fallen soldiers on the war memorial. So again we've got this idea of death 
and grief pervading the poem, leaned against it like a wishbone. It's a really interesting image. As she leans against the memorial, it's like she's making the shape of a wishbone. If you don't know what that looks like, that's something you could have a look at online, just to make sure you're clear about how that image works. You know, maybe it's her son's name that she's followed the inscription for, and that suggests how she then is kind of leaning against the war memorial. She needs the support of it. Perhaps she can no longer stand herself, which can reflect her grief. She's constantly drawn throughout the poem to symbols of loss and suffering. Your war's left damage in its wake at every turn. She cannot escape it. Okay, so we're back to now our image of the dove. Now remember, a dove is a symbol of innocence and purity often. So we see the dove again. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. So we've got this image of the freed bird again, which is what she had to do with the songbird in its cage. Metaphorically, she had to let her son go. So we're clearly now thinking about her son, who by the end of the poem, it seems that he's died and he now is free in one way. She gave him his freedom. Sadly, his freedom is that he's died and she's left as his grief-stricken mother. So she watches the dove pull freely against the sky. Now, if you think about this idea that the sky is this beautiful, vast space, and then we have this comparison of the dove as being like an ornamental stitch. So we're back to textiles, a tiny, beautiful little bit of detail, perhaps in a quilt, where she can see that as the dove flies through the sky, there's this kind of image that's a bit like her son lost in this vast space. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Now, I personally find the ending of this poem really emotional. She talks again to her lost son, so she directs her words to him, your playground voice. And what she's doing is as she stands on this hill, she's listening, desperate, again to go back to his childhood when she could keep him safe and all that innocence and freedom surrounded them. Desperately hoping that she's going to hear him playing in the school that's down at the bottom of the hill, hear his voice catching on the wind. But of course, the poem ends there and what she's rewarded with is actually silence. And if we think about the grief and the presentation of grief in the poem, then that's a really powerful emotional ending. So this is a poem about grief. It's a poem about loss. It's a poem about longing for days gone by. It's not a poem about celebrating the glory of war. That's not what this poem does. It doesn't criticise war, but what it does is it focuses on how war affects those who stay behind. It looks at the anxiety and the grief that parents feel knowing that they can't protect their own children. And it explores a side of conflict that perhaps was rarely touched upon in the more famous poems of the First and Second World War. Now, of course, in the exam, you're going to need to talk about poems and compare them together. You won't be able to look at a poem in isolation. So when we're thinking about poppies, there are lots of poems that we could look at in terms of comparison. I've just pulled out a few that I think have got some really nice things that we could do when we're thinking about similarities and also differences. So let's start with London by Blake. There's a sense of sadness and powerlessness that pervades both poems. I think everyone would be able to see how those two work together. In Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson, then we've got two poets who are responding to the theme of loss of life, and they're both talking about soldiers, but they explore it with a very different tone. So we've got Tennyson writing a very public poem in celebration of those who've lost their lives, but then we've got Jane Weir exploring a very private emotional story of a mother and her son who's lost his life. In Bayonet Charge by Hughes, we've got poems sharing a feeling of the inevitability of death in conflict, that idea that you cannot separate conflict from grief and death. In Remains by Armitage, so another more modern poem about conflict, we've got both poems using the form of a monologue, which makes us as a reader explore the emotional impact of war and its impact beyond the battlefield, not just what's happening in that moment of war, but what it does to the soldiers and to their families afterwards. 
And then we've got Wilfred Owen's poem himself, Exposure. So in both poems, whilst they're from very different perspectives, loss of life and this idea of the enormity of the gap between the domestic world at home and the world of conflict are explored nicely in both of those. And Caroline Duffy and War Photographer, both poems explore the power of memory, use the experience of someone who's not a soldier, not fighting in the war, but yet is still impacted by the trauma of conflict. So conflict doesn't become something that's just about the soldiers. In The Emigre by Rumens, both poems are exploring a female perspective on conflict and share a focus in those poems on the power of memory and link that to loss. So that's a really nice comparison there. And then Tissue by Darker, both touch on the powerful connections between humans against the theme of the fragility of life. And then finally in Kamikaze by Garland, we've got the impact of conflict on family relationships. And that's explored by both poets with patriotic glory set at odds with domestic life and relationships. So both sort of showing that actually war shouldn't celebrate glory because that's often very far removed from the reality of what happens for those families who are impacted by conflict. So hopefully this video has helped you to feel more confident in understanding what the poem's about, the AO1, that you've now got quite a few things that you could say about the language, the form and the structure and how Jane Weir has crafted the poem to create that meaning, to create those moods and themes. That's for AO2. And finally, we've talked through quite a lot of contextual information. So things that you could say about the time the poem's written, about what has inspired the poem, what we know about Jane Weir and how that presents itself and helps us understand that poem in more detail. I really hope that's been helpful. Thanks for listening.